All right, I don't have a proper headset because apparently they don't make one in child size. Hi, I'm Shira Abel. Uh, we're going to be talking about marketing for startups. I like talking with people and not to them. So if you have questions, I actually want you to interrupt me while I'm speaking. That means come up to the front, sit in one of these chairs if you've got a question about your own startup and your own marketing, and I hit on something that you've got a question for, come up and ask. Because I, I don't like just talking out to a blind audience. Um, another thing, so I'm going to talk about me for a second, who I am. Uh, I'm the CEO of Hunter and Bard. We're a marketing agency, a bunch of Americans based in Israel. Actually, we've also got a Brit and a, Cana and a Canadian. Um, we do what you need to get done for marketing. And in this case specifically, this was um, a case where the, we handled social. And the person who did social before us handled it like it was SEO and SEM, okay? So they tried to game the system. And social isn't handled like that. That's not the way to optimize your social. So it's very important that when you have someone handling your social, they actually know how to do it properly. So we changed the methodology of the social. We doubled their revenues and doubled their views to their commercial YouTube channel. This is stuff that works. That's me. Um, as I said, CEO of Hunter and Bard, I mentor at the Microsoft Accelerator, Google Accelerator, Founder Institute, Seed Camp, and a bunch of others to go into. Um, I also teach marketing for startups at Tel Aviv Alpha Academic College. Now, what are you looking to do? You're looking to have a startup. Your startup needs to be different than somebody else's. How do you create that competitive advantage? What are you going to do that's going to be different than anybody else? And how are you going to make that advantage sustainable when Me Too's come out on the market in order to compete with you, especially if you've got something that's big? We're going to start with the strategy. We're going to talk about alpha and then launch and a whole bunch of other things. I'm not going to go too much into this. I tend to go through my slides very quickly. <laughs> a lot of it is a lot of text. All of this will be on SlideShare app afterwards, so there's no reason for you to have to take pictures of anything. But I really do want you to interrupt me and ask questions. So please, if you think you're going to have a question, come up to the front. So it'll be a lot easier for you. OK, we're going to start on strategy. What is strategy? Everything that you do has to be connected to a strategy, as in the reason why you're doing it. You're not going to be on LinkedIn simply because LinkedIn is a place to be. If it doesn't bring you any ROI, you're not going to be doing a post every day on your business page on LinkedIn. On the other hand, if it does, then you'll be there. You need to test and iterate. So everything you do, every business metric that you do, you need to have a reason behind it. An example, OK? We have a client. They wanted to improve their financial performance. And uh, in order to do that, they wanted to lower their spend on ads. So they started doing content marketing. And after about four months, the ROI from the content marketing was higher than the ROI on ad spend. Now realize it did take that four months of investment. So, but on the other hand, their overall costs, they were able to wean themselves off of ads completely. So if you end up doing things properly and you know how to do them, you can end up saving yourself money. But there was a strategic initiative behind it. OK, an example, Fujicate. Fujicate is an app. And they got a lot of their, uh, they actually brought in a lot of traffic to their app and a lot of visitors to their app via their blog. So it can actually work for web and mobile. Um, OK, different strategies. I'm not going to go through this. You can read it later. And market strategies for apps. Again, you could read it later. But the thing that you need to keep in mind for absolutely everything that you do, good product has to be at the center of it. If you've got a bad product, good marketing will kill a bad product quicker than anything else. So in the very, very beginning, you need to focus on product market fit. Just out of curiosity, how many people in the audience have, are creating an app? Show of hands. OK, a few people. How many people in the audience are creating some type of web software as a service product? OK, how many people in the audience actually are doing startups? OK, um, so for the rest of you, I hope you get something out of this. Uh, OK, so we're going to go through. <laughs> Again, the holy trinity of mobile marketing is not the same as web. With web, you're going to have a lot more of, um, with web, you've got the difference. You've got more relationship marketing. You have relationship marketing with social, um, depending on your product. So if you've got a product that's 
more like, like Fujicate, which is part of a movement, then it's a lot easier to pull people in through content marketing. But on the other hand, um, does anybody actually, who here knows what relationship marketing is? One person. OK, so I'll explain it. Relationship marketing is anything where somebody chooses or opts in to connect with you. So that would be signing up for your newsletter, following you on Twitter, uh, liking your page on Facebook, uh, circling your page on Google+, or any other platform, OK? So newsletter has the highest ROI of all digital, um, of all digital marketing. And all of this would be considered relationship marketing. All the other stuff is push marketing. So that would be ads. Um, that would be anything that like, isn't organic and pulls people in on a natural level. OK, back to that. Earn media and PR I'll also get to in a minute. Uh, but at the center of everything is great is you need to have a great product. OK, performance measurement. Again, this is stuff that you could read on your own, but you need to be realistic and figure it out what you're doing. You can't have a goal of having, you know, we're going to have 50,000 people at the end of one month, and we're starting at ground zero, and we don't have product market fit. That's not realistic. So it's a nice idea, but you're not going to make it. You need to make sure that when you have a goal for something, it's something you could actually make. You could read this letter. It'll be on SlideShare. So marketing from the concept phase, OK? What are you going to be doing? You've got a product. You've got an idea. How are you going to connect to the people, and how are you going to start building buzz before you actually are out there. This is critical. You have to start getting to know people on Twitter and Facebook who are the influencers. Don't worry, Hen, it's going to be on SlideShare. You don't need to take the picture. <laughs> yes, I'm paying attention to the audience. Um, so you know, get to know people that are in your industry that are influencers. Get to know them, but don't ask them for anything. Because if you ask them for anything, you're going to be pushy. It's not nice. So at the end of the day, when you're finally ready with your product, you write to them and you ask, Will you check it out? And then they'll come back. And it's, you're a lot li more likely to get a yes if they actually know who you are. Another thing you could be doing is testing all of your assumptions. Dropbox tested their messaging and uh, a lot of their assumptions all through ads to landing pages before they actually launched. And what you're looking for when you first get started is product market fit. Product market fit means 40% of the people who use your product would be really, really sad if you disappeared tomorrow. Sad to the point of, oh my god, what happened? I'm crying. OK? When you've got that, that shows with, say, if you've got a type of product where people need to come in around once a week, 40% of the people who come to your site come back once a week. OK? 40% retention. Um, same thing works with apps. So once you get to that 40%, you know you've got product market fit. With product market fit, then you can start spending money on marketing. Until then, don't spend a lot of money on marketing. You need to spend enough in order to start getting enough users to get more feedback and get the, uh, in the product feedback loop going, but not so much as to get the mass users, because once you get them in the first time, if they don't have a good experience, they won't come back. And you need them to come back. So how do you test your ideas? Once you've got your minimal viable product, OK, and you've put something out there, you start testing and iterating and trying things to see, um, you know, putting a random button, seeing if people click it. If they click it, then you build the product. Um, I know I've read about cases where people wanted to know before making a software as a service product if people would be willing to actually purchase it. So they created a site, took people through all the way through the buying process, OK, put to the point where they put in their credit card. And then at the very, very end, after they press click on the credit card, they get a message saying that the service will be ready in another six months, and they will be charged when the service is actually ready. Um, you don't want to do that on a mass scale. If you're going to do something like that in order to test it, I recommend finding an IP somewhere in the Midwest in the US, assuming that's your market, or an IP somewhere in the equivalent of the Midwest in Europe, and, uh, and testing it that way. Don't do it on a mass scale, because it's a lot easier to beg for forgiveness than it is to, uh, to have to deal with the masses being angry at you. So um, another thing, if you decide to go that route, send them a t-shirt. Um, ads to landing pages, test messages. OK, bin an entire app. And then once you've got, do a big launch. So but with apps, it's not the same because the way the app stores work. OK? So apps are a little different. That's how it works with web, but that's not how it works with apps. How do you do an MVP with an app when you need to have a big launch? If you don't have a big launch on an app, you don't get all the juice you need to get raised up in the App Store. Okay? Both the Google Play and the Apple App Store have different rules. And the rules are when you first put your app into the store, 
you get more juice for every download that you get, and you go up in the market. And that's what you're looking for. So you can't really do an MVP with an app. Not totally true. You can. There's a hack. The hack is to launch your app in a small country, but only one small country, OK? And you can keep the same name, but you test everything. You could test the logo. You could test the, the, the slides that you put up in the actual page. Test everything that you can. And then once you get your product market fit in that one country, do massive scale launch. So that's how you can test your app. Alpha phase. Um, you can also start bringing in people in order to build your newsletter list or build your email list. Because as I said before, email has the highest ROI of all different types of digital marketing. So the more you have in your email list and you keep in touch with them on a regular basis, then in this case, once you launch, you send an email, you've got people who come in automatically. It won't be the same percentage as, say, it will, you'll have a higher percentage than you would with just launching with nothing. And it also starts building mindshare. Because something you need to think about is how do we buy? And this is actually something that's really important. We don't think about how you buy, OK? When you first hear about something, are you going to just go out and purchase it? Or are you going to wait a bit? Are you going to wait and see if this is something you're actually interested in? Are your other friends doing it? Did somebody else like it? So how do we buy? It takes a while to hear about something. You need to hear about it three, four, five, ten times before you get to a minimal level of trust, before you will even consider buying it in the first place. And that's the thing you need to think about. So every time they hear about the name of your app or brand or service or whatever, okay, the more they hear about it, the more trust you have. And the higher trust level you have means they're more likely to buy it later. So you need to get to that. So that's where sending in the newsletters and ads and everything else, that's where this all comes in. Okay? Because it takes a while for somebody who's not an early adopter to actually purchase your product. And that's what you need to start doing. The launch phase. Okay? You've got your product and you're ready to launch. Do not launch during CES. Do not launch during DLD. Do not launch during TechCrunch Disrupt or any type of major thing going on. Find a slow news day. August is wonderful. There's nothing going on in August. Nobody's reading it in August, but at least you know that there's nothing else going to happen. Um, so a slow news day. Pray that nothing else happens. Example, um, the Geek Time conference in Israel uh, had the conference on the same day that Onavo got bought by Facebook. Nobody covered the conference. All of the industry was covering the fact that Onavo got bought by Facebook. Um, and was now opening an office in Israel. So they had no way to control that. They didn't know it was going to happen. Pray that doesn't happen to you. Um, another thing. So you send an ad, and then, and then, and, and, oh, attempt of validity. OK, I'll get to that later. Sample tactics, you could look at that later. Uh, product market fit, acquire new users. OK, earn media and PR. What is it good for? PR will get you a spike. Earned media is when you get mentioned in a blog or a magazine post or whatever, OK? All the different places that you get mentioned by asking somebody to cover you is earned media. It gives you a spike of traffic and almost no retention, unless you've got something that's really perfect fit. But most of the time, your product isn't something that's that TechCrunch readers are necessarily even going to want. So why do you want to be in TechCrunch? Social proof. Um, it makes the people who invested in your company feel better, and it makes you more likely to be invested in again. Um, and it also makes it more likely for other leader adopting sites to cover you. So, and you can put it on your homepage. Um, it has a strong trust rate, a trust rate of about 40%. For affiliate SEO and ads, this is all bought, okay? You're spending money, you're buying traffic. Um, this has a 14% trust rate. Think about it. You're not going to trust an ad like you're going to trust a review on TechCrunch. But it's immediate. Relationship marketing, on the other hand, is your friends. This is word of mouth. This has a 70% trust rate. Okay? You get this through social, this, that, the other thing, blogging, posting, and it shows people you build a lot of reciprocity. Reciprocity being you're giving out helpful information. So your blog cannot be about you no offense, but nobody cares about you. So if you're going to be writing about something that only, that's all about you, the only person who's going to be interested in reading it is like you and your mom. 
which is nice, but not helpful. So if you actually want to get traffic and have people read your blog, you need to write about things that other people are interested in in your industry. So if you're doing software as a service, and say the software as a service is a publishing tool, then you need to write about publishing and things that publishers would be interested in. And how do you help publishers? Okay? And then you're going to pull them in because you're giving good information on that. Um, one company that does it really well would be Kissmetrics. Another one would be HubSpot. So here are two companies that are software as a service, and they both do content marketing and relationship marketing really, really well. Now, you may say to yourself, oh, it's free. But it's not, because it takes your time. And your time means you're not doing something else. And your time is money. Okay? You're going to have to either do it yourself or pay somebody else to do it. But either way, this costs. So don't think to yourself that it doesn't. Um, okay, now. My favorite topic, behavioral engineering. And I'm actually going to talk about two things that aren't even on the deck. The first one I'm going to talk about is a t-shirt economy. Earlier today, uh, somebody came up to me and asked me if I would talk to them about their product. And uh, so we started talking. And he's like, well, we're doing something like an Airbnb. And, uh, and what if we just give them like 100 euro credit in order to get them to come in? Well, the problem with that is it's, you know, it's fine to do. And if you've proven through the model that it will actually end up paying off through the long run, it all depends on how long the people will stay and what your customer lifetime value is and all of this. But on the other hand, it also sets up a bad incentive. Because once you start paying people to come in, they want to be paid to come back and paid to stay. And that's not a sustainable business model. What you want to build is a t-shirt economy. So what is a t-shirt economy? I'm going to give you an example. Google had a stock market. This is a, this is a case study, actually, that I took in an MBA class. So Google had a, had a stock market. And the stock market had, um, it was all about figuring out when things would be finished inside of Google, when projects would be finished. And people who did well got money, and they also got t-shirts. And these are Google engineers, OK? So money isn't really on the top of their list. But when they were offered the money, they didn't really care if they got it or not. Like if they were late on giving the money, nobody really complained. But when they were late on giving the t-shirts, the people were pissed because they wanted to wear the t-shirt, all right? They wanted to show off their status. They wanted to show off what they've accomplished. What you want to build is a t-shirt economy. It's a lot easier to get people to do things because they like it and it makes them feel good than because you're paying them. OK, this is our psychology. It may not make sense, but this is how we work. So that's what you need to think about when you're building into your product. Another bit of that, another case study also. Um, another example, Sweden or some other story, some other country in Europe, um, they did a test case of asking people inside of a city, um, if we build a nuclear reactor outside of the town, OK, so this was a situation. They asked some people, if we build this nu nuclear reactor outside of the town, would you be willing to have it be there for the good of Sweden? We need to have it somewhere in this country. I'm just using Sweden as an example. I don't actually remember which country it was. But um, you know, if we put it outside of the town, would you be willing to have it there for the good of the country? OK, and then they asked another group, if we put it there, we'll pay you six weeks of your, uh, of your annual salary, OK? Of the people that they asked who were do willing to do it for the good of the country, 50% said yes. Of the ones who got offered the money, 25% said yes. Because once you put money into the equation, people start to think to themselves, is this worth my time or not? And they start thinking about it in terms of value. And you need to think about that when you're building your product. All right, moving ahead. Once you get people to come in, how do you get them to come back? How do you get them to share? This is the most important page. This is the most important slide of the deck. Pay attention to this. All right. We've got here, OK, all these different action triggers. And everybody has one of them, OK? Reward, status, achievement, self-expression, competition, and altruism. The things on the side are just examples. You can think of a million other things. But when you're building a product, you have to think to yourself, what is the action trigger of my audience? What is the action trigger of the people that I'm pulling in and my client base? All right? I'm going to give you an example. AppSkyzer. Uh, they're a client. If you could do three lines of HTML, you can create an Android app with AppSkyzer. I recommend using them if you're going to be testing things on the Google Play Store. So with AppSkyzer, OK, we tried to, well, we, we 
did an email to see if the action trigger of their client base is competition. It's not. We got back a lot of complaints, and we had to send a lot of sorry letters and, uh, and calm some people down, because we sent an email saying, your friends are doing this. Don't you want to beat them? Well, no, they didn't. They're not competitive. That's not their action trigger. Turns out their action trigger is achievement. So we've changed the product on the inside in order to build the achievement in. So every time they do something, they get a, they get a, a reward okay, for their achievement. And with every reward, you get a dopamine rush. That's another thing you need to think about. So there are chemicals in your brain that change the way you feel about things. And I'll get more into that in a minute. So you need to think about every time you're building the product, what is the action trigger of your audience? Another example, Clash App. They're friends of mine. They're based in Austria, if I remember correctly. And they are doing an app that's about competition. So when we, uh, we had been talking about their product, and they had an amazing viral coefficient, they had low retention. They, people were coming in, challenging their friends, and their friends were coming in and challenging other friends, but they only did it for a couple weeks, and then they stopped. So my recommendation to them was to have people you know, compete against each other. And by doing that, then you build the competition into the system. You already know the action trigger of this audience because they're coming in to a competitive app. So that's obviously their action trigger. Now you need to build the product accordingly. So this is actually as important as all of your marketing. This is building the marketing into the product. How do you get people to come? How do you get people to come back? And what action triggers do they have so you get them to stay and then share it with their friends? This is important stuff. OK, go on. The next one, the hook. Nir Eyal, if you don't know who he is, I highly recommend you looking him up. So he has a blog. He's also going to be writing a book. And the book will be called The Hook. Now, what is this? This is building the habit into your product. You start with an external trigger. You get an email. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about Pinterest. I am addicted to Pinterest. It is such a time suck. If I go onto Pinterest, that's it. My day's over. So with Pinterest, my external trigger is, say, I get an email in my inbox about uh, somebody repinned one of my pins. So then I, re get, I remember the Pinterest exists. I go in. My action is I go in. I start scrolling. Now, variable reward. This is actually a very, very big deal. When you know a reward is coming, you're not as excited about it, and your body doesn't do any chemical changes. When you don't know when the reward is coming, all right, it's like a casino. Think about this. When you start playing slots, and you don't know the reward is coming, and then you finally get that reward, you're really, really excited. Um, the variable reward, the picture that I fall in love with, and I repin, or I post, or I like, or I comment, is the reason why I keep going back down that never-ending scroll. I'm looking for another one. And every time I find a picture that I love, I get a dopamine rush. And that builds a habit, because I like that feeling. Okay? And so you start going back and through and through and through. And then your investment is the time that you put into it, and the liking and the pinning and everything else. Then you go through, and your internal reward is the fact that you feel good because you just had all of these things that you just really enjoyed and found on Pinterest, and you've got all these boards all filled up, and you can go through them later on, OK? So it's how it makes you feel. We always remember things that make us feel good. You have to think about how you're building that feeling into your product. Uh, power of user narratives. This is something I recommend you look up afterwards. It's about two minutes. And this is how Jack Dorsey um, use it, does, builds products over at Square. UX Archive, another massively amazing resource for when you're building an app. Okay? This helps with onboarding, with sharing, all these different things that are going to be helpful and you're going to need if you're building a product. How do you get people to come back? How do you get people to share? Give an incentive. So how do you build the incentives in? This was actually better for Dropbox than any of the advertising uh, that they did. This has given them more people, more product. OK. Um, the other thing, email marketing. Email marketing, highest ROI. Now, there's two kinds of email marketing. There's a newsletter that people sign up for, and then there's action trigger email marketing. What is action trigger? Action trigger is when somebody hasn't come back to the site in two weeks. We miss you. When somebody has left things in the um, register, the 
basket of the site, and they haven't actually made a purchase. You've left things. Did you forget something? Okay. Um, when somebody has done an action, when you've liked something, your friend has liked your post, your friend has commented on your post. So all of these things are action trigger emails. Action trigger emails have an 80% opening rate. Okay, that's a big deal. So the action trigger emails are extremely powerful. The other emails, it all depends on how well you're doing them. Test your subject line. Do an A-B test. If you've got 1,000 people on your list, send 100 to one, 100 to another, see which one gets you the highest opening rate, and then blast it. Okay? You can also test the time of day that you send it. Because when people receive it, also matters. Don't buy lists. Don't spam. Not worth it. OK. Notifications. This is the equivalent on, uh, for, you know, notifications are important. Generally, I like around 1 p.m. I know people who like between uh, around 11 a.m. But at the end of the day, it depends on your product. You have to test it. If you're doing an app that's you know, telling people which nightclub is going to be going on or whatever, you're not going to be doing it. You're not going to be sending a notification at 1 PM. You'll be sending it considerably later at night when people are ready, getting ready, and trying to figure out where they're going out. Okay? So you have to A-B test, send to a small group, then blast. Okay. You build community. Building community in, again, the dopamine rush. How does it make you feel? With every like that I get on a photo, with every comment that I get on a photo, I want to go back. I see that little notification number, I go back and I open up the app. Another thing to consider when it comes to apps, your competition isn't just the other people in your space. Your competition is every other app. Your phone has a limited, you know, you've got so much space through your phone, you only use so many different apps. When I started using Path, I stopped using Instagram. When I started using Pinterest, I stopped using everything. OK? Your time is limited. So where is the budget of your time going to go? Where is the budget of your client base going to go? You have to think about this. It's more important, actually, with an app than it is with a website. Because what do you do? You close down your browser. You know, you close your computer, you close down your browser. You open it back up, you, you can open up a different site. It takes two seconds. But with your phone, that's all permanently there. You have to delete it, or you have to actually install it. That's making a commitment. So by doing that, you have to think to yourself, all right, I have more than just one app or two apps in my market, because they're not the only competition that you have. Everyone is your competition. Uh, community building it into both products, be web and apps. Know your market. OK, I said before, an act of virility. So when um, virality, yeah, that's more like it. OK, so when, whatever, it's been a long week. Um, so <laughs> OK, back, Dropbox. When they first launched their product, they were expecting to have a couple hundred people come into the site if they were lucky. They had over 5,000 on their first day. Why? Because they did this really simple video, but the simple video has um, a lot of Easter eggs in it. Easter eggs are little hidden bits of information that your market will understand. Um, they sent love songs to Steve Jobs and, um, and Bill Gates. OK, they did, they had a platypus. There was a lot of things that were memes, memes at the time uh, when Dropbox launched this. They put this on, I think it was Dig, because Reddit wasn't big at that point. I don't even know if Reddit existed. They put it on Dig, and it went viral on Dig, and it got them 5,000 signups their first day, which they never expected, because they knew their market. They were already spending a lot of time on Dig, and they already knew where to put it on Dig. And this costs them literally nothing. If you look up the video, you're going to find that it's just somebody talking and screenshots. Like, it's just them doing the movement of, OK, now I do this with my mouse, and I click here, and I drag over to there. It's really simple. But it came back and it turned out to be really powerful for them. Viral if you can. So if you haven't seen this, this is the um, Dollar Shave Club, and I recommend you looking it up. This went viral in the US. He got over a million in like a day or something. It was crazy. Um, and viral, and, but the thing is, is that, OK, it cost 
to make, which is incredible. However, the guy's background. He has a background in, um, in improvisation. He lives in Hollywood. He grabbed all of his friends in the industry to help him make the video and help him edit the writing, okay? Uh, he also has a background in social seating for video. So he has all of the background needed in order to make this go viral. And it doesn't necessarily mean that his company is actually doing well. It did get him funding, but I have a feeling it was probably a little too soon. I'm not sure he actually had product market fit. So I don't know how helpful it was at the end of the day. It was a cheap video to make. It did go viral. You have to think about that. Watch the funnel. Where are you losing people? This is really, really important. People are going to be going through to your site. Where is your goal for them to end up? Where are you losing them? These are all things to consider. Building an app family. This is another tactic that you can use when it comes to apps. So an app family would be building seven apps. They are closely related, but not exactly the same. Uh, games do this a lot. And all of them refer to each other. Seven tends to be the magic number. Localization. Localization is a very big deal, both in apps and in web. Okay? But when you localize, you have to localize realistically. Okay? If you're going to be building something for Mexico, the names on the site should be Mexican. The examples should be examples that they would use in Mexico. You have to make them appropriate for the place. You can't just you know, change everything over to another language, but use all the same names, use all the same examples, and have things that may not necessarily make sense. So you have to think about that when you localize. And branding. When it comes to apps, branding is actually way more important than it is for web. It's, it's, it's critical. Why? Because the app store is a lot more like a supermarket. And your logo and, and the screenshots that you show for inside of the app and how your app is designed is a big deal. Everybody likes the pretty. I mean, think about it. You're going to go for something pretty more than you're going to go for something that isn't pretty. So everybody likes the pretty. You want your app to be something that people want and that they're attracted to and that they go and look for and that they tell their friends about. So branding is suddenly really important again. Don't do ugly. It's very simple. This is an ugly app. And you can say, I, I mean, I've had somebody argue with me that looks are subjective, but I'm sorry. Nobody's going to mistake Toyota for a Mercedes. Mercedes is gorgeous. A Ferrari is gorgeous. Toyota's Toyota. It's fine, but it's not Mercedes. It's not a Ferrari. So, you know, and this, well, this isn't even Toyota. So this would be something that we designed, and uh, well, I think it's pretty. Uh, you want to make sure that you've got pretty branding. Best picks that are inside of your product need to be inside of, of the store. And uh, the text below, the only sentence that actually matters that people will read is the first one. The rest of it's just for app store optimization. Social proof and ratings, on the other hand, are critical. People can tell if they're fake. Don't go there, OK? It's really obvious when somebody writes a fake review. So have your friends write things, but make sure they actually know what they're writing about and have them give a real review. Um, it's actually good to have one bad review in the mix and have the bad review say something that mm, isn't really all that bad so that it gives actually more um, people trust it gives a higher trust rate when they see something bad and then they see a lot of good. OK, how do you turn your app into a habit? Design. Warm and fuzzy feelings. Back to that dopamine rush again. Uh, make sharing part of the experience. When it comes to apps, social is more on how you make sharing seamless and less on sharing, like, you're not necessarily going to get a lot of traffic from, say, um, people tweeting about your product. Okay? You're more likely to get a lot of traffic from buying Facebook mobile ads. It's, so, it, and then gamification. So the obvious ways aren't very popular anymore. You're going to have to think of new things. But gamification is still really powerful. Humans are still prone to all of the action triggers that make gamification work. B2B. I'm not going to go through the marketing strategies. You could read them later. Sample tactics, again. OK, communicating to an international market. I'm American. 
I think I speak English perfectly, but somebody from England may not agree with me. I also don't understand why they use S's instead of Z's and why they put U's in places where they shouldn't exist. On the other hand, it's not really my call if I'm selling to somebody over in England. I have to write like the British do. Okay? So you have to respect other people's language, even if it's supposedly the same one. So uh, think about spelling and grammar, they count. They significantly lower the trust rate. If you are not a native English speaker, find a native English speaker who actually knows how to write before you have things posted. Because just because they're a native English speaker does not necessarily know that they actually know how to write. Just because they call themselves a writer does not mean they know how to write. Um, so be careful of that and make sure that you have people who know what they're doing before you post things out there. International partnerships. All right. This is actually obviously based for uh, an Israeli audience. And I always say, ah, we're in Israel. Europe is local. Consider it. Um, and well, you're in Europe. You've got all these other countries. <laughs> Consider it. OK, find, uh, find companies that are in a complementary industry. Partner with them. Uh, cross promotion. You sell shoes. Find somebody else who, uh, who sells clothes. You cross promote. You do some type of joint email, newsletter goes to both groups. You've just doubled the amount of people that you could be sending a newsletter to, and they find out about your service. You get more signups. It's like that. So find the equivalent of that for your product. Face-to-face uh, -face is always ideal when it comes to business, but Skype works. Use it. Thought leadership. Now, your marketing, when it comes to business to business, typically works on thought leadership. If people know that you know what you're doing, they're more likely to trust you, and they're more likely to hire you. So that's a very critical part. Publishing information of things that you know and how you're a leader in the industry all works for thought leadership. Um, going. Marketing is a sales tool. All of this, you probably already know it. If you don't, you can ask me questions. Nobody's asked me actually a single question during this entire thing, and I'm almost done. Really? You have no questions? Not a single thing. You've understood everything? What? Hold on. Wait. How do I get the, There's no. Yeah. OK. OK, you said it's not good to buy people. Yeah, OK. Say when it comes to retail and cashback. When it comes to retail and cashback, it's not good to buy people. OK, now, yes, I did say that, but there's a caveat to it. If you have a lower buy rate than you get from the people, OK, if they're going to spend more money inside, or you can get more money from them on the inside, then you will from the amount of money that you spend. It's almost like doing an ad. But on the other hand, you also have to think about when you do that, you lower your brand. And that's the problem that Groupon had. All of the companies that took Groupon, they couldn't get them to come back. Why couldn't they get them to come back? Because Groupon destroys your brand value. It's a discount. And the people who use Groupon, or the companies that use Groupon, realized afterwards that they're spending money, they're losing money necessarily. OK, they do these ads, they lose money, and then suddenly they have less customers afterwards. They had this big rush. They expected a whole bunch of people to come back. But they didn't. Why didn't they? Because once you offer something really cheap, people are going to wait until you offer it cheap again. And that's why when you have a sale all the time, and when you're constantly offering discounts, you will have lower sales if you stop doing that. Uh, another example of that is JCPenney. JCPenney had constant sales. OK, this is a store in the US. They had constant sales. They decided to change their model to be low prices all the time. Didn't work. People want the sales. Their sales tanked. So once you start offering a discount and you lower your brand value, you have to realize that that's going to have a long-term effect on your brand and your company. I don't recommend taking that route. You have to think for the long term. Um, OK, marketing and sales tool, social media for research. Any other questions? More. Come on. There's got to be somebody. Nothing? Nobody's doing it. Come on. You're not doing it. You. You've got something. Oh, yeah. oh hand. Come. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you very much for your presentation. It's very useful. And my question is very practical. Uh, for example, if you would like to launch an app like Food Foodukate, yeah, in the UK, what first three steps you would do like for marketing? So, okay, the question is, if you're going to do an app like Foodukate in the UK, what are the first three steps you do for marketing? I would say first you need to test your market, make sure that the market actually exists. Um, that would be probably ads to landing pages uh, to see if people would sign up for the sign up for the mailing list to, for the app itself. Okay, so you get to see a conversion rate for that to see if it's something that people are even interested in. Check the market to see if there's already something out there. See what your competition is. If you have competition, the odds are there's already something for that. If somebody's already had a win in that area. And then the final thing I would probably do is, um, well, for apps, you can't really do a minimal viable product. And if you're aiming only for the UK market, then you have to think, what would be the business model? I mean, are you going to be going after, are you going to be making money from the consumer itself? Or are you going to be making money from the stores? From the consumer. So you'll be making money from the consumer. So how are you going to be making money from the consumer? The app would be for free, but if they like uh, want to feature it for themselves, so we would pay. And also, we would we would. What features would they be paying for? Um, for example, if they, the the app is like if you want to buy a product, you check like if if it has. Okay, uh, so it's almost like affiliate. It's almost yes. It's like an affiliate network for supermarkets. Okay, so for something like that, I would see if there's already something like it in the market that probably already is. Then you have to wonder about if somebody's going to be doing something like that rather than just using the app from the supermarket itself. Okay, um, and then you'll probably be offering it from multiple different supermarkets in order to aggregate so that, and then you have to think about the cost of delivery um, and how they're going to be making money off of that. You have to think about the costs and how much people will be willing to do it. Um, but on top of it, I would probably just look through the actual market um, and see what else is out there and see how big the actual market size is. Um, after that, for the marketing, once you launch it, well, you partner with the supermarkets. So you have the supermarkets promote your app. You do cross promotion with the supermarkets. That would be the best way to get out there. That would also be the cheapest way to get the marketing. You have a question? Okay. Uh, Stanislav Smitskus, Tasmov Studios. Ashmarachu, I have one question. Okay. When is possible? Actually, when it is possible and when it's right time to start so, uh, recent, re represent yourself in social media and in the marketing, I mean, schemes? As quickly as possible. Yeah, yeah. The second you decide to start the product, you do the Facebook page and you do the Twitter page. And if you've got the time, and hopefully you've got some type of time, you start building the content. So um, the content can be stuff on your blog, but the content can also be you writing guest posts for, say, TechCrunch or Mashable or some other place like that. And these have to be how-to posts. They're not about your company because nobody cares about your company yet, especially if you haven't launched. So you write about, say, your Vidme, which is an Israeli company, and you're doing a how-to post on how to do a video for, um, you know, to, for a Kickstarter campaign. Okay? So let's say you're Vidme, you're doing this as a how-to post. You get it posted on the next web. All of these people find out, one, about your product that is coming up soon, and two, that you're something around video, and three, you build reciprocity because people know that you exist. So that would be something that you could be doing as before you even launch. Uh, another one who does this really well is Iris Shore from, I can't pronounce the name of her company, Ty, Ty, Iris Shore. <laughs> So these are people that you could look up uh, that do these things really well. But basically, you want to get to know the people in your media. You want to start building, uh, building interest in what you're doing, building buzz, and getting yourself known. And the, easier, the more you do that, the more people will be interested in your product when your product actually comes out. Does that answer it? OK, cool. Um, OK, back to this. Marketing sales tool. Social media for research. So a lot of the time when you're doing a B2B, social media is going to actually be more, be more for research than it's going to be for, um, for selling your product itself. If, you're sell if it's a long-term sale, say an eight or nine months or a year and a half sale, you're going to be seeing what's going on in the market and where the pains are through keyword research and everything else on social media. Uh, and it's also a way to figure out who's covering you on the industry. Now, Reportive. Do you know who, what Reportive is? How many people use Gmail? All of you need to know what Reportive is. <laughs> yeah, you know. That's not helpful. <laughs> OK, Reportive. 
is a web app on Chrome. You want to download it, OK? And Reportive shows you the name and the information of the person that you're sending an email to when you're sending email, OK? So this is my editor at the Next Web. I also write on the Next Web. And, uh, and so if you put in the name and you get the email right, this is, what, this is a hack, all right? So when you put in the name and you get the email right, because you're looking for somebody in an organization and you want to get to them, but you may not necessarily have their email. If you're looking for their email, you put in a whole bunch of guesses. When you finally get to the right one, it magically shows up on the side. And you know you've got it. So this is a great way to get to people on the inside and send them an email. Um, another thing, you want to find out who it is that you want to connect to on LinkedIn. You're looking for people on LinkedIn. You want to connect to them. Now, I have a total brain crush on Rory Sutherland. He's a behavioral economist. He's uh, over at Ogilvy, and he's a genius. And I highly recommend looking up his TED Talks. So I wanted to connect to him. Um, I found out what groups he was in on LinkedIn. I joined the groups, and then I was able to send him a direct connect. OK, so that's another way for you to be able to connect to people on LinkedIn. Because otherwise, you can't get to them if you don't have their email. And if they don't know you exist, they also can't connect to them. But you can connect to them if you're in the same group. So go and see what groups they're in and go join those groups. Uh, if you're looking for a name, but you don't know the person's full name, you just have a general idea of their title, and they work for a certain company. I'm obsessed with Everlane. It's a clothing store. and they're uh, funded by Kleiner Perkins, and they're amazing. Um, so let's say, Michael, he's the CEO of the company and the founder. How can I find his name? I go and I take all the information that I can see from LinkedIn, I put it into Google, and bam, there's his name. Now I click on the link, and I can see his full name. Now I can actually call the company and ask for him by his full name. If I just ask for Michael, I won't be able to get through. That's another thing, call. Why? Because nobody does it anymore. So it's a lot harder to say no to you because people aren't actually used to saying no anymore. So you call, and when you call, you stand up, and you smile, and you make sure that you have the posture and everything else of somebody in, in power and control. You don't wear your pajamas. You wear nice clothes as if you're going to go into the meeting itself. You get yourself completely psyched up for this, and then you call. OK? And why do you do that? Because it's a lot harder to say no to somebody when they look and sound nice. And you will actually sound different on the phone when you smile, when you stand, and when you sound confident. It's a lot better than, like, say, you're just sitting there in your pajamas, and you're just like this, and you know, it's just totally different. So you want to get to somebody? You stand. You smile. You stand in a powerful position, and you make that phone call. And you ask, oh, may I speak to? And you give the direct name. OK, I'm done. So if you've got more questions, come to me. This is just random stuff I like. Colette Ballou talks about PR. Uh, before you actually have product market fit, I recommend you do the PR yourself. It's not worth the money otherwise. And uh, this is a great slide share of how to do your own PR before you have product market fit. After you have product market fit, you won't have the time to do it yourself. You're going to have to get an agency. So then you'll have to deal with that. But in the meantime, you could look this up. And I have a thing for reviews. So if you like funny reviews, check these two out. Questions? None? All right. Yeah. Oh, no. Nope. Go. Ah, the slides will be on SlideShare. SlideShare.net backslash Shira Abel. That's it. All right. Thank you.